Read God's Word. Open your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, I'll be reading uh, beginning in verse 19 uh, and reading down to the end of the chapter. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into the image made like to corrupt or I'm sorry to corruptible man into birds to four-footed beast and creeping things wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lust of their own heart to dishonor their own bodies between their selves themselves who changed the truth of God unto a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change their natural use unto that which is against nature. <clears throat> and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their heir which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Let us look now to our Lord in a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love to us, mercy and grace and watch care over us. We thank you, our Lord, for the day that you have provided and blessed us with. We thank you for each and every one that is here today. And Father, we pray that you would be with us as we've assembled together in the house of the Lord, that in everything we say and do, that we bring honor and glory to thy name. I pray, Father, for Brother Joe and Sister Jamie, and, and Father, I pray that you would just continue to lead and guide them. And, Help them, Lord, to, uh, to, to make this transition as smooth as possible. I pray for Brother Rick and Sister Joni as they'll be traveling, Lord, that you give them traveling mercies. I pray for each and every one of us that are here today. And Father, I ask that if there are any here that know you not as Lord and Savior, that this would be the day of salvation. And Father, I ask that you would be with me as thy servant, and may you give me liberty and unction from on high to present thy word in truth and in love. Forgive us of our sins, and these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. This morning, I'd like to preach to you on the subject, the attack of biblical Christianity. The attack, we could say on biblical Christianity. So I'm sure that by now you have caught on to the series of messages that the Lord has given me over the past couple of months. I'm really focusing on Christians being Christians, following the Bible and living the principles of God's holy word. The text in which I have read to you this morning summarizes how we are as a culture today. 
Wherefore, verse 24, God gave them up to uncleanness, to the lust of their own heart, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God unto a lie, and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And so we have seen in our culture today a massive attack on biblical Christianity, a massive attack on the authority of God's Word. That they have served the creature, that is, the plant and the tree and the grass and all the different things in the beast more than the one that created the heaven and the earth. <clears throat> and we see people filled with unrighteousness and fornication and wickedness. We see haters of God. We see children disobedient to their parents. We see uh, all these different things, the proud, the boasters, the inventors of evil things. We see that prevalent in our country today. And I set a challenge out to each of us as we closed out 2015. Do you remember what it was? It was, it was time for us to do something to teach the world about the Lord Jesus Christ in God's Word. And then as we began 2016, we've been learning about those in the New Testament that were willing uh, to share the Gospel, both privately as they spoke to people, as folks came to them, as Paul spoke in front of multitudes, as the Lord Jesus Christ spoke in front of multitudes. But they shared the Gospel and just before all of that, what did we do? We spent some time and did a lot of lessons on Christian apologetics. Spending some time of why we believe what we believe. Well, beloved, this past Friday, my daughter Dinah and I went to the Creation Museum. It was Dinah's treat to me. She took her birthday money and wanted us to be able to go and spend an entire day at the Creation Museum. And if you know anything about me at all, you know how much I enjoy going to the Creation Museum. I'll tell you, a good time to go is January and February. Maybe no more than 300 people in the entire museum at any one time that day. We also have the blessed privilege of hearing Ken Ham in person, and then our favorite singer-songwriter, Buddy Davis, also performed that day. Of course, walking through the museum and just had a wonderful wonderful time. Getting to meet Ken Ham in person, the very founder of Answers in Genesis, and listening to him speak was probably the highlight for me. And then, of course, it gets me thinking about creation. It gets me thinking about our country. It gets me thinking about all kinds of things. And so, you're going to get a bunch of that <clears throat> this morning, the Lord willing. One thing that is fascinating to me as I think about the attack of biblical Christianity is that the attack is not just with the culture. The attack of biblical Christianity is found in what would some call Christian quote-unquote churches. They are not holding to biblical creation. And when you don't hold to biblical creation and when you don't hold to the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis... And this board, we're going to show you some things, is why we're in the mess that we're in. That'll make sense in a minute. People, pastors, and members alike, are not preaching about the Lord Jesus Christ and not teaching the history of the Bible. And I hear it all the time. Well, that's Old Testament and it's irrelevant. That is false and untrue. We need the Old Testament. God has left it for us in His Word. In these so-called Christian churches, they teach evolution and people are believing the lie of billions of years. And you think, that's radical and you're wrong, Pastor. I'm not. Not just because Ken Ham has said it. I did some research as well. Pastors are neglecting to go back to the beginning, to Genesis chapter 1. And if we can neglect Genesis 1 through 11, we're missing out on a whole lot of history that our society needs to know. 
And yes, it is 1,000% true that belief in a young earth is not a requirement for salvation. You understand that it says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, the word of God says, For whosoever shall call and believe upon a young earth, no, it doesn't say that, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. And so salvation is not based on a belief in a young earth. But beloved, there are so many things, and Ken would be the first to tell you that. Ken Ham would be the first to tell you that that salvation is not based upon uh, the belief of a young earth. And in fact, over and over again, when he was being interviewed at the opening of the Creation Museum back in 2007, people would ask him, what is it that you're hoping to accomplish? What is it that you're hoping to do? And he would tell them to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to say that also throughout the duration of this message at least one more time. But beloved, that's not our, I mean, that, right, it says in the Great Commission to go out and to preach into the world, right, and to teach them all things. And so we have a responsibility to teach those that have uh, faith and trust and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ the history of the Bible. History is important. And you will see why as this message continues. So we're going to spend some more time in the coming weeks, looking at some more apologetic type messages, some practical messages. Not the same at all as the series of messages that we already had during our last study. But my job is to preach the gospel and to equip you and I to go out into this very confused world. And don't worry about science. Science is in the Bible. And science proves the Bible to be true. No matter what Bill Nye, the science guy, and the other, other evolutionists try to say. So let's look at this message this morning. We're going to look, first of all, that biblical authority is what's under attack. The authority of the Bible. And secondly, I want to look at the rock, the solid foundation. <coughs> I'll be using two books in particular to help me along with these messages, just for your reference, and if maybe if you'd like to, uh, to, to know what they are, or maybe get a copy. Uh, the first one is one of Ken Ham's uh, first books, not his very first, but one that he wrote 25 years ago and has been adding to it, simply called The Lie. The second one, How Do We Know That the Bible Is True? That one is composed by a variety of authors, but edited by Ken Ham and Bodie Hodge. Bodie Hodge is Ken Han's son-in-law. All right. Biblical authority is under attack. As I read to you Romans chapter 1, I'm sure you thought about our own nation. I'm, I'm sure that at least one or two parts of that, as we read down verses 19 through 32, that you know and you understand that we are living in very challenging times. On the whole, our Western culture, which was once permeated by Christian thinking, is becoming more anti-Christian every day. We are seeing steady increases in gay marriage, support for abortion on demand, unwillingness to obey authorities both children in the home and society at large with authority. We are seeing an unwillingness of people to work because of the handout society in which we now live. We are seeing marriages being abandoned, clothing being abandoned. We are seeing a rapid increase in pornography, an increase in lawlessness, and aggressive marketing campaigns by atheists promoting their views, just to name a few things that we see going on in our culture today. As I mentioned in the introduction, as Ken Ham was asked by hundreds of reporters when the Creation Museum was opening in 2007, they said, Ken, what is, I don't know if they said Ken, but they said, what is the real motivation uh, at Answers in Genesis? What is the real motivation behind uh, you opening uh, this creation museum? And Ken, and I quote, said, the thrust 
of answers in Genesis is to uphold the authority of God's word. As we will not only provide answers to the questions of the skeptics, but also preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. End of quote. To uphold the authority of God's word. You see, beloved, what's under attack is the Bible. What's under attack is the authority of God. What's under attack when people stop ignoring the word of God. And when God said to us in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1 verse through verse 11, when God's word is not held as the authority, this is why we see the decline that we see in the culture today. And so, the purpose of a group like Answers in Genesis, and by the way, Answers in Genesis, Ken and Ham cannot do it alone. It's up to us, right? It's time for us to do something. It's time for pastors, it's time for teachers, and it's time for members to go out and be able to speak the truth of God's Word and uphold the authority of the Word of God and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, we uphold the Word of God. And the Word of God provides answers to the questions of the skeptics. And then we tell them about Jesus Christ. You see, it's God's Word that is under attack. And because Genesis 1-11, through and because history, and we're going through, I, I'm telling you, I say this from time to time, I don't say it often enough, but I absolutely love going through the Old Testament on our Sunday school courses. One, because I still don't know enough about the Old Testament as I should, and Brother Terry makes that pretty much known every week. Anyway, <laughs> in, love. in love, that's right. But it teaches us so much about the world that we live in today. So much of, of why we do what we do today is because of what God said back in His Word. So it's God's Word that's under attack. And because history is no longer important in the churches, and the humanistic mind set begins to come out, all this is, is just another book. That's all that it becomes. That's all it becomes to my children and to your children. The humanistic evolutionist mindset says that the Word of God is just a great book of literature, which the Word of God is a great book of literature. And the Word of God is a great book of history. And the Word of God is a great book of science. But I'll tell you what about the Word of God. The Word of God is authority. And people don't like authority. And so this is just another book. So if we can get the Word of God out of the churches if we can get the Word of God out of the homes, if we can get the Word of God out of the schools, if we can get the Word of God out of the courthouses, here's what we're left with. Here's what we're left with. And I'm not sure if all of you can see this, but I'll go ahead and just come up front for just a little bit. Here's what we're left with. So the authority of the Word of God, of God's Word, is under attack. The authority of the Bible Creation, Genesis 1 through 11. Now, God's Word gives us law. God's Word, Genesis 1 through 11, tells us about marriage. God's Word, Genesis 1 through 11, tells us about the standards of life. God's Word tells us about the meaning of life. But when we start getting man's opinion, we see humanistic idealisms and we see the evolutionary train of thought leads to lawlessness. Would you agree there's lawlessness in the land today? What do we see? Gay marriage. Well, how did God define marriage? Well, well, Pastor, that's, that's that Old Testament stuff again. Why are you going back to Genesis? We've got to go back to Genesis. We've got to go back to Genesis. God tells us in Genesis. He tells us how to be married in the New Testament also in Ephesians chapter 5. God's Word gives us standards about lust. When you get into man's opinion in the humanistic evolutionary way, we see the rise of pornography in our country today. God's Word tells us about the meaning of life. We see this humanistic mindset leads to abortion. You see what man's opinion can do. And you see what's important, and that's God's word. That's the foundation upon which we need to build our lives. We might go back to this here in a little bit, but I wanted to make sure everybody got a pretty good view of it. <clears throat> so as generations...
generations, as I said, this is a generational problem. But as generations begin to reject God's word as the reliable, you know God's word is reliable, amen? Can I get, I mean God's word is reliable. God's word is reliable and God's word is authoritative. And as people and generations begin to reject God's word as the reliable or authoritative source, we have an overwhelming amount of people that have brought the idea of evolution and billions of years that have come in to build a secular worldview based on moral relativism. You say, what's moral relativism? You know what it is. You've heard of it. You have your way and I have mine. It's all relative unto how I feel. Moral relativism, there's no right and there's no wrong. You know, it's interesting, right? So they are desecrating, I say the gay and homosexual movement, desecrating God's design for marriage, uh, ignoring the biblical authority where one man and one woman should come together. And that's interesting, though. They want to keep the two part, right? They want to keep the two part, right? But they want to get rid of God's part. People want to keep what they want to keep. And because of moral relativism, the culture at large says that's okay. Guess what? It's not okay because God's word is the standard and God's word says one man and one woman. So it's biblical authority that's under attack. Naturally then, when I say biblical authority is what's under attack, what we're saying is that God is under attack. God, and, and really that's just ludicrous because we know that at the end God will win. Amen. Jesus Christ is victorious. Beloved, I tell you now, and I've said already, there is an absolute, and it is God's Word. And I'll also tell you now that hearing about it just a couple of times a week in church is not enough. We have got to permeate our lives with this stuff, and that's what I'm going to talk about in a second. God's Word is true, God's Word is authoritative, and God's Word is right. And we're going to spend more time next week, the Lord willing, in being able to see that the Word of God is true once again. Not using the same lesson, using something totally different. But I'll tell you now, and I'll read to you the scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 3. In verses 15 through 17, 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The Word of God is true, and we'll talk about that later. But as I said, it takes more than me talking to you about it a couple of times a week, a couple of times a month, three or four times a year. We have got to permeate our lives with this. Listen to what the Word of God says. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34, we have got to be willing to talk about biblical creation and biblical marriage and biblical, just biblical everything. In the book of Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34, the word of God says this, O oh, generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. So what's in the abundance of your heart? Evil things, good things. Get the Word of God in you. Get the history. Get it in you. And tell people about Jesus Christ. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 23 and verse 7, the Word of God says this. Proverbs, chapter 23 and verse 7. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Pretty convicting. What you thinking about in your heart? Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but the heart... But his heart is not with thee. What's your heart full of? Secular, humanistic thinking, where, where I, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to preach about God's word. We don't want to talk about creation. We don't want to talk about authority. People don't like authority. They don't like, and, and of course, the lack of authority has led us to all kinds of lawlessness and all the, all this stuff. What are you filling your heart with? What are you filling your mind with? It's important. <laughs> You see, beloved, when people ignore Genesis 1 through 11 and ignore biblical authority and start buying into humanistic ideologies in our schools, in our workplaces, and in our government, that's what begins to fill their heart and their mind. And when these ideologies start coming into school and work, we got such teachings as removing God from the Pledge of Allegiance. 
we start removing creation out of the public schools. And this one's really tough because most children only get a few short hours of creation. And then their friends and their teachers and everybody else tries to erase the few short hours of creation that they get in the house of God. And their friends and their teachers try to cram that evolution garbage down them the rest of the time. And that's why, listen to this. Again, these are statistics Ken Ham brought up. They're in his books. They're not Ken Ham statistics. They hired the, you know, the, the, the people that take statistics, not just a Christian organization, okay? So it's not biased. It's an unbiased uh, 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 rating. Do you know? 95% of our children are in the public school system. Only 5%, even just now, even with the homeschool grew, uh, movement growing, only 5% only of our children are homeschooled. 95% of children in the public school. Do you know that after the time they graduate, that 70% of them leave the church? 70%. Why? Because I can't give them everything they need to know in three hours, first of all, or two hours. And all they hear otherwise is everything contrary to their one, per one person says. It's time for us to do something. <laughs> We've got to teach some biblical history. The school textbooks do not teach creation at all, not even a little. And so our children are being indoctrinated by the religion of atheism. They are being indoctrinated against the authority of the Bible. Against God. Children are taught to be disobedient to parents, Romans chapter 1. Children are taught to be disobedient to their teachers. Children are taught to be disobedient to law, lawlessness. How's that working out? How many of you would feel 1,000% safe? I'm telling you. Now, I get it, right? We are, we are saved. Those of us that are saved by the grace of God, we know that no matter what man does to us, we're going forever to be with our Lord, so I get that. But let's say, let me just throw you into downtown Cleveland or downtown Miami, give you nothing, and just tell you to go out there in the roughest time of night and live in that neighborhood, live where all the drugs are. How would you, how would you feel? Would you feel 100% safe? Would you say lawlessness is coming to our land? I would say that it has. Anyway, I digressed. Sorry. <laughs> so, man's opinion, humanism, evolution. I told you it led to a couple of things, and it leads to racism and abortion. Marriages falling apart. Families breaking up. Pornography. Removal of the Ten Commandments from public places. Gay marriage, and so on and so forth. So, yes, the attack... It's on the authority of the Bible. It's on Genesis. Because back in Genesis, we learn about marriage. Back in Genesis, we learn about the importance of, the, of life. Back in Genesis, we learn how to live in society. Back in Genesis, we learn about what happens when man sinned. Yeah. Death. And guess what? There was nothing man could do to cover his own sin, was there? God had to make them a covering of coats of skin. Isn't that right? Yeah, where do we learn that in Genesis? Where do we learn about death? Where do we learn about it? We learn it from Genesis. Beloved, people are gaining momentum by not trusting God's word. They're living their own lives the way they want to live, and this world is in horrible decay. Sounds a lot like not only what we read in Romans chapter 1 in our text, but turn over, if you would, to the book of Judges. Sounds a lot like what was going on in the day of Judges. Hmm... Listen to this in chapter 21. Judges chapter 21 and verse 25. It's the very end of the book, very last verse of that book. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Yeah, moral relativism. That's what it is. Seems right to me. I'll go ahead and do it. We need to trust in the Bible. Yes, God is sovereign. Amen. And he knows everything about everything that I'm saying, everything that's going on in our world. But that's why, you know what? He says to fight the good fight of faith. And he tells us to get up and do something. We must stand up. Stand up for Jesus. So the Bible must. Listen, no highway option here for children of God. The Bible must be the foundation of our thinking. <laughs> We've got to start with the Bible. We're not trying to cram the world into the Bible. We're starting with the Bible. And when you start with the Bible, the world makes a whole lot more sense, right? The world makes a whole lot more sense. 
Then death, disease, suffering and pain, heartache, creation, salvation through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ makes a whole lot more sense when you're try trying to cram the world into the Bible, but you start with the Bible. We've got to start with the Bible. Which gets us to the second part of our message, the rock, the solid foundation. Now we see all around us, if I said in this message, that the foundation is being ignored and beaten down. Turn, if you would, to Psalm chapter 11 and verse 3. Psalm 11 and verse 3. And here's what God's word says. Psalm 11 and verse 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundations be destroyed. So, beloved, my brothers and my sisters, my young and my old, I, sorry, wow, right back there. What we need to do is return to the solid foundation of the Word of God. What we need to do is return to the solid foundation upon which we were built. You know what that is, don't you? You better believe it. Yes, the Lord Jesus Christ, the rock that he established his church upon. And turn over, if you would, to the book of Matthew, chapter 16 and verse 18. And I'm just, I got to get to these kind of quick, so I'm just going to get to it and read it. Matthew 16, 18, and the word of God says, And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter. Watch this. He says, you're Peter. You're a man. Right? He says, Peter, thou art Peter. But upon this rock. In other words, Peter, I'm not going to build my church upon you. I'm not going to build my foundation upon you, Peter. You're just a man. And you're fallible. And you're imperfect, Peter. He says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it upon this rock, upon the word of God, upon the authority of God's word. That's the foundation that we need, upon the rock. Upon the rock. And then over there, the book of Ephesians, chapter 2 and verse 20. Ephesians, chapter 2 and verse 20. The Word of God says over here. Oh, that doesn't help. I put a bookmark in the, right in the middle of the New Testament. That's right where I went. Ephesians, chapter 2 and verse 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone. We need to get to the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. The teaching from His very Word. We cannot and should not be ashamed to speak up and speak out against the moral issues of our day. And listen, the moral issues of our day lead us to be able to talk about God's Word and salvation. You say, Pastor, how does that work? Well, I'm going to tell you. So we know about the moral issues of the day. We know about abortion and pornography and God, uh, you know, gay marriage and lawlessness and all the issues of the day. And you say, how are we going to preach Christ? Well, you can preach Christ, right? We've been talking about that in the last four or five weeks. But go back to the beginning. Take them to the beginning. You say, what, what do you think about the condition of the world today is? And I don't think there's going to be very many people that say, oh, the world is just in great shape. I'll tell you what, I just... No, but you bring them back to the beginning, and you know what it says in the beginning in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31? Here's how you can talk about the moral issues of the day and talk about Jesus Christ. Here it is. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31, the Word of God says, And God saw everything that He had made, and behold, it was very good. So you tell them about the beginning. You tell them about how God, in the very beginning, He created everything, and everything was very good. And then you can begin to talk about death, which means you're going to talk about sin, you can talk about how there's disease and decay and immorality. How? Because you went back to the beginning and you told them that in the beginning of creation, God said everything was very good. But pastor, they don't like creation. They don't want me talking about it. Hey, listen, if they're going to talk to you about all their stuff, then I tell you what, they hopefully will respect you enough that you can talk to them about yours. And you bring them back. So yeah, we can tell them that everything was very good. And tell people that God created everything. And that because of sin, we have death. Because of sin, we have death. Once again, we tell them the beginning. And we tell them about death and sin. And because we can tell them about death and sin, guess what else we can tell them about? The redemption that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Is history important? Is the foundation of the Bible important? You better believe it. You better believe it. It's good for us today. You can tell them about the redemption that is in Jesus Christ and Him alone. So yes, 
I say, yes, you can use the moral decay of our day to tell people about creation and about the beauty of life, about the beauty of marriage, and why marriage is one man and one woman. And then that brings everything to the history of Genesis. And then we tell them Romans 3.23, don't we? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We tell them that man sinned. We tell them that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, as it says in Romans 3.23. And then we can bring them to Romans 6.23, right? For the wages of sin is death. We tell them about death. But then we tell them something else, don't we? We don't leave them there. So we talk about the moral decay of our society. <clears throat> we tell them about how God created it and how everything at the beginning was very good. We tell them about death. We tell them about the wages of sin being death. But then we tell them about the gift of God. We tell them about eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then we bring them over there. What? Then what do we do? Well, we can bring them over to Romans chapter 10. And we can tell them about verses 9 through 13. And we can tell people that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. We can tell them about their heart. We can tell them about Jesus Christ. We can tell them that it says in verse 13, for whosoever shall fall, call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We can tell them about the grace of God in Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Isn't that awesome what we can tell them when we start with the beginning, when we start in creation? Isn't it awesome what we can tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ when we tell them about the beginning, when we tell them that God created a perfect world? It's awesome. Now I know, and careful with your amens here, I'm no Ken Ham. I know that. And as I said, he's one person. And there's, you know, of course, there's those on the staff there, David Morton and some others, Jason Lyle. You know, Jason Lyle's the astronomer, by the way. If you've ever been to the Christian Museum and you see that planetarium, he's the one that figured out all those distances. Well, I mean, he and other scientists, all the distances and all the cool things. And, you know, basically with all the stars, all the universe, all the galaxies, right? What does God say? He made the stars also, right? You can, bring, you can point people to Jesus Christ. You can point people even by astronomy, even by, you know, the stars in heaven. We don't have to ignore the stars. They're there. Right? They're part of God's beautiful creation. Part of God's beautiful creation. You tell them how God created everything good. You tell them how man sinned. And then you tell them about the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. I mean, that's a great plan right there. You can't go wrong when you tell people about Jesus Christ, our Lord. She can't. <clears throat> so yes, the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the very Word of God, the blessed authority of the Word of God. You see, yes, yes, we need Genesis 1-11. through We need to tell people the good news of creation. We need to tell them where death came from. And then we tell them how to be saved. Acts chapter 16 and verse 31. Acts 16 and 31. And they said... Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. We tell people about Jesus Christ. Then teaching our children and our grandchildren about a young earth. Yes, it makes a difference. And yes, it's teaching about, about that and the culture, you know, you know, begins to show us why gay marriage is wrong and why abortion is wrong and why all these different things are wrong. The biblical foundation tells us these things. That's why we must teach it. By pointing, of course, people to Jesus Christ as the Savior of sin. But as I've said, God's Word is no longer the foundation of a person's world view. It all started back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1 when that serpent, that old devil, deceived Eve. Hath God not said? Hath God said? Let me read it. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The serpent planted doubt, verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. So the devil's been after the authority of God's word from the very beginning. So beloved, let us stand up for the authority of God's Word. Let us, to those that are doubting God's Word, those that 
are undermining the biblical authority in society as a whole and in churches. And let's tell them about Jesus Christ. And let's tell them about Genesis. Let's tell them about creation. So as we close, that's why the Lord, I believe, one of the many reasons why the Lord tells us in the book of Matthew to what? To be salt and to be light. We must fight the good fight of faith, as it says in Timothy, willing to be light in this dark world. And today, this morning, I know you've heard a lot, right? You've heard that the authority of God's word is under attack. You've heard about our country today, about our nation, about our world. You've heard about the beauty of creation. You've heard about sin and death. But most of all, and I do mean most of all, I hope that you've heard from the Word of God about the Lord Jesus Christ, yeah. the one who saves sinners. You know he saved sinners? He saved me. I know he saved some of you that are here. May God use his word and add the blessing to it. I thank you for your attention to the Word of God this morning. As we stand in prayer, God has worked the work of grace in your life, and you'd love to come and tell us about it. We'd love to hear about it. As we dismiss in prayer, uh, again, you just come and you can tell us what you need to tell us. It'll be great. Remember to pray for the food. Come back at around 1 o'clock. May God use his word and have the blessing to it. Brother Terry, if you would please pray for us. <clears throat>